so welcome everyone. I am going to be very, very brief since I'd like to hear from Aaron and, and Nick, and, and I think uh, they should be the center of our attention. I, I've been making remarks at the uh, presentations of the diversity research uh, uh, lectures for about a dozen years. And, and typically what I do is I talk about all we've accomplished in the area of diversity and enhancing diversity and strengthening diversity. I don't want to do that today. All I would like to say, and it's really my message, is we can do better. We may have done a lot of things over the years. We haven't done enough. We can certainly do better. And we really need to redouble our efforts. As active as we've been, we need to redouble our efforts. And hopefully we can focus next year, if it's the kind of, of, of good year that I expect it will be, on faculty hiring and enhancing diversity there, and just overall doing a better job of something we all consider to be an enormously important priority. So having said that, let me turn it over to the Senior Vice Provost, Maggie Abraham. Uh, thank, thank you, Herman. Uh, can everybody hear? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Herman. Uh, I, I want to, first of all, thank the Provost uh, who has been pivotal in starting the uh, and our, this office in starting the Diversity Awards. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Hello and welcome to all of you. We're so pleased to have the presentations by our 2021 grant recipients today for the Diversity Research and Curriculum Development Grant and the LGBTQ plus research initiative grants. These are, grants are very important they're one way of sharing our research that, that the faculty are engaged in. But before we start the presentation, I want to acknowledge Alison Zorn, coordinator of, events and, coordinator of Events and Communication, Office of the Provost for coordinating this event so well. I also want to take a, a moment to acknowledge the National Center for Suburban Studies that has previously um, supported some of these grants, though initiated by the Provost's Office and co-sponsored by the Provost's Office. Uh, having said that, I'm going to, we have two presentations today. Our first presentation is by Dr. Erin E. Riley, Assistant Professor of Psychology, who's a 2020-2021 recipient of the Diversity Research and Curriculum uh, Development Grant. Dr. Riley's uh, presentation is titled, Piloting a Mentorship Program for Underrepresented Groups uh, in Clinical Psychology. Erin is an assistant professor in the clinical psychology program at Hofstra University. Prior to Hofstra, she received her PhD in 2017 from SUNY Albany. She completed her AP uh, accredited pre-doctoral internship at the University of San Diego School of Medicine, VA, uh, San Diego and post-doctoral fellowship at the US UCSD Eating Disorder Center. Her research interests include better characterizing maintenance mechanisms and sharing features of anxiety and eating disorders, and using this knowledge to adapt behavioral treatment for use in, in eating disorders. Her secondary line of work focus on characterizing barriers to A, the implementation of evidence-based research in real life clinical settings, and B, the use of best practice assessment and statistical techniques in applied research settings. So let's welcome all of us, welcome Aaron, Dr. Erin Riley. Erin. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the provost for um, hosting uh, this today and, and allowing me an opportunity to talk about um, some wonderful work that I'm a part of as a part of the uh, Clinical Psychology PhD Program Diversity Committee. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about an ongoing initiative um, from our diversity committee focused on providing mentorship for uh, students that are from underrepresented groups in, within academia. Um, I will jump in today. All right. So I think in, as we begin to have these conversations, um, about uh, diversity and enhancing diversity within our educational environment. The first step I think often is acknowledging that we all um, have a range of different identities that contribute to who we are and the frame through which we're approaching this work. Um, on the left here, I have a, a 
uh, graphical representation of a wheel of power and privilege. So thinking about all these different, all of us have different identities with regards to our gender, sexual orientation, citizenship, education, abilities, et cetera. And all of these influence, again, how we see the world and from where we approach our work in, in making a more diverse community. And so I, in, in doing that, I wanted to acknowledge that my particular lens is coming from a place as a white uh, cisgender female professor. And acknowledging that, knowing that I am allotted a lot of power and privilege because of my place within society. Um, and for me, that it, it constitutes blind spots and things I need to be aware of. Um, and for me, it's a huge priority that myself, alongside other faculty members who have this privilege, are using it to make education more equitable for all. So I wanted to acknowledge that sort of frame that I'm approaching it from. I also wanted to acknowledge before I get into anything about the project um, that while I am presenting this work, this is very, I'm here really as a representative from our diversity committee. And this work has really would not be possible um, if not for this fantastic group of students, um, all of whom have put a lot of time and effort into um, thinking about how we can make both our program and the field a more equitable place for all. So with that, um, today I'm going to be talking um, and beginning with a conceptual background. And so thinking about this question that really has guided not only this particular initiative, but also more generally our work within the diversity committee. So thinking about creating and sustaining a diverse educational community that supports all students in meeting our goals. So when I, I'm in beginning to think about this question, I'm going to talk about educational systems more broadly, academia more broadly, and then zoom a little bit in to focus on clinical psychology, um, which is my obviously area of, um, of interest. Um, then I'll briefly describe some of the aims of the project, our, method, our methodology and how we're approaching the project, as well as some challenges that we face more generally and, and also related to um, executing this project during COVID. Um, so begin, again, be, before jumping in, I wanted to start with an acknowledgement um, of some of the larger issues at play that we need to acknowledge. So um, over the past, um, you know, many years, people have been engaged in work exploring structural inequalities, but I think, um, as we all would acknowledge, um, over the past year, this has become more and more at the forefront of our work as educators um, and important for us to acknowledge. And so for folks that might not be familiar, what do I mean when I say systems um, like systemic oppression or uh, structural inequalities? What this refers to is our systems or structures within society, things like the criminal justice system, the education system, access to housing and other resources. We know that in um, currently within America, there are significant structural inequalities and bias within these systems. What I mean by that is that based on an individual's identity, um, their race or ethnicity, their sexual or gender identities, their immigration status, the socioeconomic status, all of those things that were represented in that wheel I, I put on earlier, confer either privilege or bias within these systems, right? And in, um, <clears throat> in doing so, they've created a system where there are invisible barriers that limit people based on their demographic characteristics. Um, and when I say invisible barriers, what I mean by that is that within these systems, whether it be education or the criminal justice system or any of the systems I mentioned, the barriers are only visible for those that they affect. Ma individuals from majority groups um, are not aware of the systemic um, privileges that they enjoy within these systems because, and that in that invisibility of many of these barriers, if we don't acknowledge them, keeps the system kind of going and keeps reinforcing these inequalities. Um, in addition to differential access to resources and opportunity based on identity, we also know that individuals from um, marginalized groups have significant experiences with discrimination that confer stress. Um, and this can compound their um, the inequalities experienced with resources, um, and of course, we know that this, both of these processes manifest in the educational system. So based on an individual's background, um, underrepresented groups are given less opportunities and um, have less opportunities to thrive within the educational system and can be exposed to experiences of discrimination and stress that influence their outcomes. So again, I begin with this really large kind of vision just to, to note that when we're thinking about approaching um, developing programming and improving our educational environment, we need to keep these invisible barriers in mind. And this is something, again, that I think as the diversity community, we continually talk about. Um, 
designing programming that really helps to identify and make visible these barriers and um, address them. So now I'm gonna zoom into clinical psychology. Um, when we think about professional psychologists, those working as psychologists, um, we know that current data suggests we are really failing to create a diverse community of trainee psychologists. Um, when we say diversity, again, we're, we're thinking of it uh, quite broadly, but particularly among individuals that are underrepresented within academia, we're failing again to uh, effectively recruit and retain these individuals. Um, a recent survey of practicing psychologists suggests again that the psychologists' um, identities are not representative of the general population. We see that the majority of psychologists are white. Um, we also see that um, in compare, so this is true of, across a range of different identities. Um, only 4.2% of the psychology workforce identifies as disabled compared to 18.7% of the population. And so again, I, I note um, race and ethnicity and disability here. However, again, across the spectrum of privilege and power, we definitely see underrepresented um, uh, groups less commonly represented within this group, uh, psychologists in, in general. So when thinking about, okay, why, why do we have this problem? Why, is our, why are our psychological providers not representative of the general population? There's a couple different places at which um, this um, lack of diversity may be manifesting or, or due to. The first is a pipeline problem. Um, for many folks are probably familiar with this, um, but what we're referring to when we say a pipeline problem is perhaps um, when we think about the, the uh, pathway coming from uh, secondary and then um, undergraduate education into graduate school, it may be the case that um, there's a lack of diversity in the students that are applying for and seeking um, uh, graduate studies. That would indicate again that the, when we think about the systemic inequalities and lack of access to resources, that it's happening prior to entry into the graduate program. And data does suggest that is the case. Um, data does suggest that the pipeline is not significantly diverse. Um, and there's also data to suggest that that's not the only problem. Um, despite the fact that groups, um, underrepresented individuals come in with the same exact qualifications as their majority peers, we see higher attrition in these groups too. So there's issues not only with recruiting diverse perspectives and individuals into our programs, but retaining them. And so really, again, this is a huge issue for, um, again, academia more broadly, but, but certainly within clinical psychology as it relates to us. And so we're constantly thinking, how can we can cultivate a more diverse workforce in psychology. The solution that often is, is the first solution is let's recruit more diverse students, right? Again, begin to tackle that pipeline problem. However, we know that recruitment cannot be the only aim for a couple of different reasons. Um, like I uh, mentioned before, more generally in data from um, the, the STEM fields, um, Data suggests that despite increasing numbers of individuals um, receiving these higher education degrees, the proportion of these individuals that go into leadership roles later in either private or academic settings remains low. So again, that points to there's not only systemic barriers um, and there are those invisible barriers throughout um, the undergraduate process, but also within graduate education and beyond these individuals, um, there are systemic barriers there. Additionally, we note, as I noted before, the attrition from graduate programs in psychology is higher among individuals from underrepresented groups and um, individuals from these different groups report exposure to various forms of discrimination, stigma um, through things like microaggressions and lack of support within. So again, we need to focus um, not only on recruiting more diverse students um, within our program, but also creating a safe, inclusive environment. So once they arrive within our programs, we can help them thrive. And I think this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, creating this environment, creating this safe, inclusive environment matters at many levels. Um, certainly most proximately, we want to improve retention for our students. Um, we want to increase diverse perspectives within the classroom. Um, Time and time again, data supports that increasing the diversity um, and diverse identities within a classroom, within an educational environment benefits every single person within that environment. Um, we can improve our training programs in clinical psychology through greater availability of diverse role models and mentors. Again, the more we can support underrepresented individuals in seeking um, and thriving in academic positions past graduate education, um, we know that greater representation on faculty, um, as well as in, in leadership positions, helps inspire the next generation and offers them specific mentorship. 
And then finally, more broadly, we know that increasing the diversity of the psychology um, workforce actually down the road helps us address many of the health and mental health disparities that we see um, and have, again, has become more and more clear um, in the past year. So one way to continue to retain and support underrepresented groups is through enhancing mentorship opportunities. Again, I think this goes without saying we're in a bunch of a room with a lot of wonderful educators. Mentorship is critical to success. And we also know that it's one of those resources that may be more or less accessible or readily accessible based on your background and access to these educational resources and sort of um, the hidden language of how to navigate academia. So this is something, again, that is a resource that is not equitably distributed. And we know, interestingly, there's been a range of different efforts to increase mentorship within psychology for underrepresented students. We know in particular that there's um, that finding mentors who have similar backgrounds and have faced similar challenges is even more important. There's some challenges in doing this, however, that I want to acknowledge and have influenced um, both how we're conceptualizing this project and, and executing it thus far. Um, in particular, the challenges are that available mentors for psycho psychology students may or may not have had the experience necessary to provide guidance on a wide range of issues. Um, again, thinking about many of these systemic um, barriers that our, our students may face, if the mentors are all from a majority group, they may or may not have knowledge, um, depending on whether or not they've taken, um, they've been able to acquire that knowledge later. Um, so in matching again there's this sort of feedback loop where if we don't have a diverse faculty we then don't have um, available mentors for the students that can provide mentorship on those issues and sort of this is feedback loop the other thing to acknowledge and has been really at the forefront of um, our mind in, in approaching this work has been that often in developing these initiatives those individuals or, or academics from underrepresented backgrounds end up taking on the lion's share of the work and end up having undue burden placed on them to, to continue with this work, right? Instead of being properly compensated for their time and or um, having folks in the majority group take on these roles. I wanted to just briefly, um, again, um, provide a, an overview of our program at Hofstra. Um, the diversity committee was founded several years ago and we focus on, again, both recruitment and retention within our program and also just in general to clinical psychology. Um, I've placed our um, site here if you'd want to learn more about our initiatives. And um, today, obviously, we're going to focus on this particular initiative that's really in the retention piece. Um, we began thinking about this um, prior to um, a couple of years ago and thinking about, can we develop a specialized mentorship resource from our students from underrepresented backgrounds? In particular, providing them with mentorship, not only that would complement what they were receiving from our current faculty, but allow them a, a safe, inclusive space where they could talk about issues related to um, navigating academia. So the aims of the project were to recruit both mentors, clinical psychologists, and mentees um, from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who would be willing to participate in a pilot program. So as this was a pilot, we really, um, we had never done something like this before. We've never done something like this before. And so we wanted to um, really gather data on how can we do this most effectively in a way that benefits all. Um, we were gathering, as I'll mention in a moment, both qualitative and quantitative data over a six month period um, regarding participants' experience in the program. Um, use this feedback to refine the program for future use. How can we make this the most effective and most um, beneficial uh, possible and disseminate findings um, to the larger field of psychology? At least in my reading, um, many of the trainings that I've attended and the resources I've accessed have been outside of psychology. There's been a couple of places where people have published on their efforts, but um, again, quite limited in the literature. And again, I think it's happening. I don't think that people are, um, people are collecting systematic data or at least publishing on it. And so um, it was important for us to approach this as something that could not only enhance our offerings at Hofstra, but also um, help the field. So again, our vision when we were designing this um, program is that again, there's this pilot feasibility focus. We were keeping it quite open and continuing to keep it quite open just so we can kind of grow and iterate um, based on the experience of our students and the mentors. Um, in particular, like I mentioned before, um, 
we wanted to make sure that we had a range of mentors that had a, a diverse backgrounds. We began by recruiting first and are still recruiting from the Hofstra alumni community. The reason for doing that was that we wanted, um, if possible, our mentors to not only have um, knowledge regarding navigating academia, um, uh, being a member of an underrepresented group, but also knowledge specifically of the Hofstra program, because I think there's nuances that, um, in particular, that could be helpful um, to acknowledge or or just appreciate more generally in, in navigating the mentorship relationship. Um, we plan to match them um, based on a baseline survey, what they are looking for in terms of a mentor's characteristics, what type of um, what type of content they were hoping to focus on, and then um, design the six month mentorship relationship um, and keeping it really open. We said, you know, we plan to uh, keep it, have it be six months, but they can extend it longer if they find that it's beneficial. Um, the focus of the mentorship is really open and dictated by both members. They can focus on anything that they they term um, to be relevant. Um, meetings happen once a month and then access to resources um, for structuring the relationship. So what I mean by that is we wanted to provide them again with a super open um, template, but also if they wanted support in you know, setting goals, um, developing some type of mentorship contract, we have resources that um, we provide to the mentors to, um, to help with that. Um, we are re currently recruiting, as I'll mention in a moment, mentors and mentees from a wide range of different identities, right? We wanted to really sh um, cast a wide net with regards to folks' backgrounds. So um, folks can, uh, can identify as being from um, a uh, underrepresented racial or ethnic background, gender identity, sexual orientation, SES and educational background. I think this is another thing that can be really, really important to provide mentorship to folks for whom they might be the first student in their family to attend college or, um, or graduate education, um, their spirit, religious or spiritual background, nationality, immigrant status, disability, age, et cetera. So really um, encouraging any student from um, an underrepresented group to participate. We're giving folks a range of different measurements. Um, I list the key ones here. In particular, we're interested in getting preliminary feasibility and acceptability data. So this has um, taken the form of a lot of questions related to their satisfaction with the program, um, their mentor or mentee they were assigned, um, the decisions that we made related to requested frequency of uh, meetings, how long it is, getting quantitative feedback on all that and how much they agree that that was effective. We're also interested in whether having this mentorship relationship as has been documented in other groups buffers some of the stressors that underrepresented students um, face on, within um, graduate level education. So we're providing a perceived discrimination scale as well as a psychological distress scale. Um, we got these particular measurements from other um, similar programs um, that were in the literature and we will be giving them at every time point throughout the mentorship program to see changes over time. Um, we also have a lot of open qualitative feedback for um, the individuals. We, were, we will be having um, interviews that uh, folks who participate uh, will conduct and um, really focus on suggestions for improving the program, how we can better support the program, um, and verbal descriptions of what were you talking about with your mentor, what did you find helpful, um, and how do you think that this has influenced, if at all, your trajectory in, in graduate school. These are the procedures here. Um, again, um, we have all individuals who are interested complete a baseline questionnaire after they're provided with informed consent. Um, and again, to help us with matching, but also just get a good sense of, um, uh, to get a good sense of, of who is taking advantage of this resource. Um, then we do matching. The um, folks that are participating in the program will match based on um, specifically the mentors and the mentees um, preferences. Then again, once uh, given their match, there's two follow-ups, a three-month follow-up from the baseline, as well as a six-month follow-up. So um, as, as has been the case for all of us, um, the past year has given a lot of unexpected challenges. Um, so currently, um, we are in the process. We've recruited our first um, round of mentors and mentees. 
um, and have um, begun collecting that data thus far. Um, so we've got our first round. We're probably going to have a second round in order to get to our anticipated sample size. Um, but our timelines were definitely pushed back during COVID. Luckily, we had been casting a wide net with regards to mentors who had been in different places. So we always planned to conduct this via Zoom. And so that actually was one way in which COVID did not pose a new barrier for us. Um, and instead, we could kind of seamlessly move into what is now normative for us. Um, we also um, had a lot of, not a challenge per se, but had a lot of discussions related to how best to recruit and select mentors. Um, again, we ultimately decided um, we began by recruiting from the Hofstra alumni community, um, which has worked uh, fairly well thus far. Um, we also plan in the future, um, in the second round, to recruit more broadly through um, different professional organizations. Um, one thing that we've been thinking about and, and wanting to kind of, I wanted to bring up in a discussion point was thinking about both visible and invisible forms of diversity too. And so um, as we were, we did a first round of recruitment and we noticed that um, we hadn't provided an opera, uh, like our operational definition of diversity. Um, and we noticed that uh, students had, again, um, didn't think that they would be eligible of the program um, if they had different forms of diversity, in particular invisible forms of diversity. So um, it was a good lesson for us to, we ended up doing our second round of recruitment. Um, we actually went into different labs and provided a more um, verbal definition of the program and, and just really being clear about um, our inclusive nature or our inclusive definition of diversity and that um, we noted that there was increased interest after that. And then one thing from a research perspective that has been interesting is that um, several of the um, students who are helping with the project or interest, were interested in helping with the project were interested in participating um, themselves in the mentorship program. And so we ended up running into this interesting piece of like, um, if they're executing this research, can they participate in the research? And so we also don't want to limit their opportunities with mentors um, because they're participating in it. So ultimately, we decided that um, we don't want to at all restrict this amazing resource or um, and so uh, any folks that are involved in um, the research side of things do not participate in the research study component, but there are they are participating in the mentorship program more broadly. Um, so as I mentioned, we're we are now in our first wave of um, collecting data from our um, mentees and mentors um, and really excited about um, you know, moving forward with this and providing this resource and also being really responsive to the feedback and, and seeing how this could grow and, and whether or not it is useful. I wanted to thank again the Provost Office for supporting this um, important work and again a shout out to the diversity committee um, and the amazing students who really have been like kind of the heart and soul of, of putting this together. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, uh, I think we can give a round of applause now itself uh, through our action. Thank you so much. That was uh, a very interesting uh, and thoughtful presentation, but also I'm sure we will have questions uh, after, uh, to follow. Our next speaker is, um, our next presentation is by Dr. Nicholas P. Salter, Assistant Professor of Psychology, who's a recipient of the 2020-2021 LGBTQ Plus Research Initiative Grant. Dr. Salter's presentation is titled, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Leadership. Nick Salter is an assistant professor in the psychology department. He's, he currently teaches workplace psychology in the industrial organization master's program, as well as the applied organizational psychology program. Classes he currently teaches include work motivation, performance management, and diversity and inclusion in the workplace. As the director of the workplace inclusion, leadership and diversity, research lab, his interests explore issues of diversity and inclusion of all kinds in the workplace, including gender, race, sexual orientation and intersectionality, among others. Um, 
some of the 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 topics he uh, in uh, that he tries to address and questions are in what ways do underrepresented populations experience the workplace differently in what ways are their experiences similar to majority populations he's also particularly interested in the unique experience of minorities in leadership positions he has been invited to speak to multiple organizations about this topic and has served on various society, uh, society for industrial organizational psychology committees, including the LGBT committee as a chair of the research team. He and his students regu regularly present at national conferences such as SIOP and Academy of Management, as well as publish in various scholarly journals and academics, uh, academic books. Let us all welcome Dr. Nick Nicholas Salter. Uh, great, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Thank you all for having me and uh, speaking today. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome. I'm going to talk about uh, the study that I uh, conducted um, with the uh, funding from the LGBTQ plus and research initiative grant called Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Leadership. Um, I won't speak too much about who I am because uh, Maggie just gave that wonderful introduction, but um, as she said, I'm, I'm Nick Salter. I'm in the psychology department. Uh, my research, uh, I run the WILD Lab, uh, Workplace Inclusion, Leadership and Diversity. And so uh, between what I teach, uh, what I research and also service committees I'm on, kind of my, my lens through which I, professional lens through which I look at um, my life is through diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm super excited to talk to you all about this today. Um, let me talk to you about kind of um, a, any good story has an origin story. And let me talk to you about the origin story of where the study I'm going to talk to you about came from. Um, I think for me, this kind of started um, in 2014 uh, when Tim Cook, who was uh, the CEO of Apple, came out as gay. Um, it was a big deal at the time for a number of reasons. Um, but one of them, he was actually the first um, openly LGBTQ uh, CEO of a Fortune 500 company, as you might know, Fortune 500 companies are considered like the top of the top. And at the time, there's nobody that was openly out at the time. And so for him to kind of like be very vocal about it was a really kind of a big deal from many angles. Since then, a number, of, a number, though a very small number, but uh, others, uh, uh, Fortune 500 CEOs have come out. At the time, one of the quotes he said um, in his kind of coming out interview was, I'm proud to be gay and I consider being gay among the greatest gifts God has given me. And this really resonated with me for a number of reasons. And one of them was just kind of think about my own experiences. I identify as a gay male myself and just kind of what stories I had heard growing up. I grew up a lonely gay kid that didn't come out and tell anybody for a long time. At the time, I didn't have any role models to look up to. I didn't, there was no Will and Grace on television. There were no gay characters. I, I, the one gay character I could think of at the time was just kind of always crying and sad. And so, so much of kind of the story around being LGBTQ is often kind of negative and just all these like sad stories we go through. And I think that's very, very a big part of the experience of being any minority or an LGBTQ person in particular. Um, but it's not the full story. And I'm always, the lens through which I look at my work is kind of looking at this full story of kind of the positive aspects, the negative aspects of, of being a minority. And so I wanted to kind of look at the study uh, and leadership experiences of this population through this lens. Um, I've also, I'll, I'll mention, I've been, me and my collaborator, I'm working with uh, Dr. Lily Blocker from uh, Stony Brook. And we've been trying to do this study actually for years now, um, since not that long after 2014. And we hadn't been able to do the study uh, because we couldn't secure funding, but because of the uh, grant uh, that I received from the provost office, I was able to do it. So I'm just beyond thrilled by all of this. So let's talk about the study a bit. LGBTQ leadership. Leaders um, we know from research and just from people's experiences often have kind of some of the biggest impacts on people's workplace experiences. You know, people often say like, people stay for the people. Yeah, it, it, they don't stay for the job. And that's true. Like if you like what you do, you can find that lots of places. But if you don't like who you work with, then that's kind of a reason people often kind of leave. Or if you like who you work with, that's a reason people stay. And so as an applied psychologist, I'm always interested in kind of how can we help people? And so understanding leadership 
which is, has such a big impact on people, really is one topic that can really help us help people and help them uh, and, and enjoy their jobs better. That being said, there's actually uh, been kind of very little empirical research that's been done on LGBTQ leaders. Um, there has been, and I, I, I need to acknowledge, kind of a lot of kind of like non-traditional research, not empirical research, um, but kind of a lot of like the traditional stuff, especially like we see in my field, there's just not, not as much. And so I think it's a kind of an important area to look at, you know, what challenges this unique population faces, but also what particular strengths these leaders might have. Um, looking at these strengths, I think is particularly interesting. There's been some, a lot of theoretical work that suggests that the experience of coming out as LGBTQ, navigating that life might lead to strengths that might benefit you as a leader. You know, so in other words, like if you have to come out as gay, you have to kind of always be thinking to yourself, can I tell this person? Should I not tell this person? Should I monitor my words? Should I play the pronoun game? So I never say he, I always say they or something. So people don't know what's going on. You're always kind of interpersonally reading the room, you're being very adaptive, you're being very flexible. And those are skills that really can help you as a leader. And so those are kind of ideas that I kind of want to empirically test and see, is this actually what's really happening? So this is kind of the larger lens through which I'm looking at, uh, I want to look at the phenomenon. Let me tell you a little bit about the study that uh, we conducted and are still conducting. Um, the participants in the study, uh, we conducted uh, uh, interviews with 52 participants who all self-identified as leaders. We were very broad in what leadership means. And so some people were leaders, they had been um, uh, execs in their field for like decades. And some people were like, you know, in, in their college group projects, they were just kind of seen as informal leaders. We really wanted to get a broad perspective on leadership. Um, I, I, you'll see the percentages here, I kind of are rounding a, a bit because we are still analyzing the data right now. Um, but about half the sample identified as gay, half the sample identified as queer and actually, and about, excuse me, quarter, and about a quarter identified as bisexual. So as you can see here, not that many, uh, not as many females identified as lesbian. They might be more, in my particular sample, might've been more likely to identify as queer and bisexual. Though again, don't quote me on the final numbers here because we're still analyzing as we speak. Um, about 50% of the sample was cisgender male. About a quarter was 25, a uh, quarter was cisgender female. And about a quarter uh, identified as trans, non-binary, gender queer, something along there, uh, which I was really excited because 25% is a very high percentage. Uh, that's a lot higher than the population. Um, I didn't particularly try to oversample trans folks, but they just happened to over respond to my study, which I was so excited about because it's a hard sample to find. Similarly, I didn't particularly try to oversample people of color, but like 40% of the sample of, of who responded and who participated in the study were people of color, which I was really excited about to uh, um, get a broader perspective here. Um, and then also, as you can see here, the age, uh, the youngest person was 19 years old and the oldest person that participated was 70. So a really nice broad range of, of people in general in this study. Um, we recruited through snowball sampling. Uh, the only stipulation is that they had to be in the US because I didn't wanna add that another element to the study of kind of what country you live in. Um, but I just started posting on LinkedIn, on my Facebook, I reached out to a lot of community centers and was like, hey, will you advertise my study? Um, I got some good responses there, but then I started getting even better responses when my participants started emailing their colleagues and posting on their LinkedIn and whatnot. And so it really worked out well. The interviews were about 30 minutes each, all conducted over Zoom. I conducted them personally myself, um, and they were all conducted last semester in the fall of 2020. Um, the procedure, um, it was, as I said, it was a video interview and we, we asked for buckets of questions within each bucket. There was a lot of like sub questions, which I don't need to get into. And uh, they, we asked some demographic questions, of course, as well. But essentially the, the topics came down to what challenges do you face as an LGBTQ leader? What strategies do you over, uh, employ to overcome these challenges? What are the positive aspects of being an LGBTQ leader in your experience? 
And then also, how do you think LGBTQ, being LGBTQ influences your creativity? Um, this creativity question was, I, I mentioned that my colleague is Dr. Lily Blocker and her area of research and interest is leadership and creativity. So um, she had some ideas about why creativity might be of particular interest to this population. So we studied it. Now, before I talk about the results, I just kind of want to take a second and say like, this is like literally like the coolest thing I've ever done uh, in my professional life. Listening to people tell their stories, it was just such an amazing opportunity to just hear people say what they've gone through. And, you know, I said, I, I conducted them all myself. Um, I remember one week I actually had 20 interviews in one week. And so listening to all these stories, it was just like such a cool, I just wanted to like geek out and listen forever. If you're ever interested in kind of doing something very cool, just interview people and you'll hear um, these things you'll never hear again. Let me talk to you about some of the themes we found. Now we literally found a billion things. And so I, I won't have time to go into everything. I'll, I'll kind of give you like a big picture overview, but of course um, I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, but as I said, the first uh, bucket that we asked around was what challenges do you as an LGBTQ leader experience? And we found a number of different themes and I'll kind of highlight a, a few of them right now. Um, kind of on a basic level, just like you'd expect, we found people saying that they experienced discrimination. Um, we found people saying they experienced stereotypes. Stereotyping was very interesting in our study because obviously some people talked about like negative stereotypes, people like, oh, well, they assume because I'm, you know, LGBTQ that like there's something wrong with me or something like that. But negative stereotypes actually wasn't as common as problematic positive stereotypes. Like a lot of like gay men would say things like, yeah, because people know I'm gay, they say to me like, oh, you're gay. You must be like really, really like funny and you must love shopping. And like all of these things that like they're being conveyed in a positive light, but the person that said it to me was like, it was diminishing. It kind of made me feel like I'm nothing more than like this like silly character. And so interestingly, these were, uh, uh, the stereotypes became a challenge in a way that we might not have expected. Um, we found um, tokenism or kind of being seen like spotlighted as like the only person of your status was a problem people experienced. Um, negative culture, of course, we saw people talking about their organizational culture, the local uh, culture that they lived in, if they, where they physically lived, and also industry as well. Um, um, Aaron, I heard one of the things that you said was um, uh, extra work being put on folks, and that was a theme that we saw in our study as well. People being uh, saying that like, because I'm LGBTQ, they're like, oh, you're a diverse person? you can do diverse stuff. And so like, can you help me with this committee on gender? Can you help me with this work on race or something? And sometimes they were like, this actually isn't my area of expertise. Just because I'm gay doesn't mean I'm all knowing about all diversity issues. And it became a real burden on them. Um, organizational policies at times were problematic. And, and also at times status and visibility was a problem. So <clears throat> it's, this is, <laughs> some people disagree with this and I could talk all day about this, but some people would argue that being LGBTQ is a less visible status. And at times um, uh, people found that difficult because they were experiencing these uh, challenges. People were saying negative things without even knowing that the person was LGBTQ. And so they're saying like, because people don't know I'm LGBTQ, it just causes more problems around me. So as you can see, a lot of different challenges came up. And even though I kind of started this presentation by saying um, I'm interested in the positive aspects, I don't want to diminish the fact that a lot of challenges come with being LGBTQ as a leader. We then asked what strategies do you employ to overcome these challenges? And again, we came up with a lot of uh, different themes that came up in the res responses. A lot of people said they just kind of relied on the fact that they're a leader. And being the leader, there are some advantages that come with that, you know, like people are less likely to say nasty things to you if you were their boss. And so like, you know, it, it, it's not nice to point that out, but it was a real advantage in some points. Um, a lot of people said that they really relied on being authentic and that helped them kind of overcome some of these challenges. Um, a lot of people uh, self-advocated for themselves and became very self-reliant. Um, we saw a lot of people talking about self-monitoring and in multiple ways. 
they talked about self-monitoring in the way that you'd expect or the way that I would have expected at least saying that like they made sure that like if they thought the person around them wouldn't be accepting they didn't talk about their partner they used gender neutral pronouns so that like people didn't catch on to who they were or they just didn't talk about LGBTQ stuff but then a lot of people also talked about um, nonverbal self-monitoring like they were saying like you know I, I you know uh, lesbians that would go out of their way to paint their nails and whatnot to make sure they came across as more feminine so people wouldn't know they were gay um, or gay men that weren't painting their nails. A lot of gay men talk, and it's funny actually, as I said, because I realized I've been doing this for the past couple of minutes, but a lot of gay men were saying they wouldn't use their hands when they spoke. Um, I use my hands a lot when I speak over Zoom because I think it's kind of boring to listen to people talk over Zoom and hands might help. But a lot of people, gay men were saying, that is a nonverbal signal that I'm gay. And so they wouldn't do that as much. Um, a lot of gay men also talked about, and I'm not, this is kind of, I guess, verbal and nonverbal. Um, they lowered the pitch of their voice. So gay men that would like, usually might talk like this, might make sure they talk like this. And again, this was not a one-off. This was a theme we saw. We saw a number of other themes um, uh, to overcome some of these challenges. People said they re relied on role models or social support. Um, they use some of their identity-based strengths, um, such as like, you know, like I talked about earlier, being gay helps me kind of understand people better. Being gay helps me navigate situations better. And then at the end of the day, a lot of people just said the strategy, the best strategy I use to overcome challenges is I just make sure I am an awesome worker. I make sure that my work is so good that nobody can call me out for um, anything else. We asked about what are the positive aspects of being an LGBTQ leader. Um, interestingly, I said that extra work was a negative aspect, but some people actually saw it as a positive aspect and saw it as extra opportunities. So in other words, some people were saying, you know, I'm kind of a lower level junior person, but I was given the opportunity to be on very senior committees because I'm LGBTQ and they wanted that voice at the table. So some people actually saw that as a great extra opportunity. And related, some people saw that they were seen as more credible to do diversity and inclusion work because they were a minority themselves. A lot of people talked about having strength in interpersonal skills, strength in skills at um, advocacy and helping other people. Um, a lot of people talked about higher levels, having a more emotional intelligence and empathy. And then finally, also a lot of people just talked about what's the great thing about being LGBTQ at work just connecting with other LGBTQ people and networking and getting that social support. Um, as I said, we were interested in creativity. And so we asked, um, the very first question was essentially, do you think LGBTQ leaders are more creative than non-LGBTQ leaders? Just flat out ask that. And it struck uh, strong opinions, I'll, I'll say that. Um, from the start, some people were like, yes, absolutely. LGBTQ people are much more uh, creative than um, non-LGBTQ folks. And then other people like really like push back against that. And they're like, that's a stereotype. You know, there's nothing more or less inherently um, creative depending on your sexual orientation or your gender identity. And so we have some hypotheses around that, but it was very interesting. People felt very strongly about this question. Um, people talked about ways that being LGBTQ helps them be more creative at work and, um, and solve problems differently. Uh, they said that being LGBTQ helps you to understand other people's perspectives better, adapt to task better, come up with new ideas, all of which helps you be creative and problem solve. A lot of people also just talked about creativity as survival. They said, every day I'm fighting obstacles because I'm LGBTQ. Every day people are trying to push me down. I have to be creative to figure out how to fix these issues. I have to be creative to figure out how to like overcome these challenges. And so it was very, it's very, it's fascinating. Um, some ge general larger themes that we found, a lot of everything I just talked about really depended on identity salience. Or in other words, um, I, in my head at least, started to kind of think about some people identified as gay professionals and some people identified as professional gays. Some people in my study were like, being gay is just one part of who I am, but it's not the first thing people would think of when they think of me at work. And other people were saying, you know, this is kind of an inherent, crucial, hugely important part of who I am. So kind of like how they responded to all those questions depends on that. 
a number of people uh, were very clear about, you know, I'm going to tell you about my experiences, but I'm not the spokesperson for LGBTQ people. Uh, my experiences aren't necessarily the only experiences that LGBTQ folks have. Um, we saw a lot of people talking about intersectionality, or in other words, saying, well, yes, I'm gay, but that's actually not what affects me the most. Uh, my race is actually what kind of affects me more so, or um, the, the fact that I have a disability or something like that. A number of people also said that they really felt responsible towards the LGBTQ community. A lot of people said, like, you know, as a leader, like, I feel that I need to use my platform to help other LGBTQ folks. Um, uh, um, as Allison said in the beginning, um, um, the National Center for Suburban Studies has historically been a, a big proponent of this uh, provost office grant that I got. And so it got me thinking about like, what are the experiences of being an LGBTQ person in suburban area versus a urban area? Um, so we asked questions about that. What were your experiences? And it was interesting because like, I think one might assume that if you're talking about LGBTQ people, they would say like, of course, being in a city is better. It's more accepting, uh, um, there's more resources. And people did talk about that. But a lot of people talked about the advantages of being an LGBTQ person in a suburban area. A lot of people said like, it's nice being in the suburbs because there's less LGBTQ people, so you know each other better. There's more connection, there's more community. And also even with, with non-LGBTQ people, like it just, people felt closer. And I think that was something that seemed to be missing from people that were talking about urban experiences. And so it was interesting for me to kind of see some pros and cons to both sides. So in conclusion, uh, um, thinking again about this quote, I'm proud to be gay and I consider being gay among the greatest gifts God has given me. This was really kind of the experience that I, I, I heard um, from these stories. Um, the study that I uh, conducted yielded so many interesting stories, some sad, some were uplifting. I hope that uh, my work and just kind of other work in general continues to give this population a voice, empower them as leaders. I wanna see more role models out there. Um, Aaron, it brought me so much joy that you use Frog and Toad as uh, uh, your closing picture because Frog and Toad, if you don't know this is actually could be considered gay role models. Go Google that afterwards if you're interested. I wanna thank you all for listening. Um, I wanna, of course, I, can, I, I want to thank a billion times over my participants because they did so much for me. And I really want to thank the provost office for uh, uh, giving this grant. As I said, I tried to do this study years ago. I couldn't do it. So like the funding was crucial for it. Um, funding during COVID, uh, especially last year when like things were so hectic with COVID, wasn't not the most sure thing. And so I just I'm so grateful and I'm really appreciative. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Yes, let's give a real big uh, round of applause to Nick Salter too. We have, uh, thank you to Aaron uh, and Nick. This, these have been two incredibly uh, interesting but informative and also uh, uh, presentations, but also, you know, ask us, make us consider questions that are methodological questions, outcomes, but also how we can shape and uh, promote diversity. Um, we we hope we can have many more of these kind of sessions and and have a as we move forward as you finish up your projects, uh, uh, you know, be able to present this in different venues, uh, which are not only in your professional organizations but in the community and at the university. And that's really what these diversity grants are for the seed money to start something and then be able to move forward. We want to now oh, so thank you once again. We want to open up. Um, uh, for question answers from the, the audience, we already have one um, from yeah, yeah. Co uh, Camilla. Uh, so, Alison, do you uh, do you want to, or, or Camilla yes. can you know be? Well, Camilla, do you want to ask Nick? Sure. Um, so the question for Nick was just about: Did you find any differences or concentrations based on industry? Because I'm curious about are there's you talked about or culture? Are there certain industries where it's easier? to you know, come out and say you're a gay leader versus others. And I know this. there was a lot of conversation over the past couple of years, is America ready for a gay president? So that was something that was under discussion. So I guess you know, going along with that theme, um, did you find any kind of pattern? 
So as I said, we're currently coding the data. And so analysis comes next. We, industry is one of the variables that we'll look at. So I don't have any quantitative answers to that yet. Um, I will say that we found more variability in the, the industry that people work than I expected. Um, we did find a lot, we did get a lot of people in higher ed. Um, I will say that. And I think part of that may have just been like a, a, a effect of like, people in higher ed got on and then they encouraged their higher ed colleagues. Um, so I, um, um, so there is a lot of that. I will say that like there was people that were working in industries that you wouldn't necessarily think of as kind of the most like traditionally gay friendly industries, you know? And so it, it became interesting. Um, I mean, there was uh, people that were doing, um, uh, um, oh, my mind is blanking right now. Um, you know, accounting and, you know, I want to say construction, but for some reason, I don't think construction, but kind of more kind of like manual labor type stuff, you know, things that you wouldn't expect. Um, obviously, um, from a self-selection bias, I think it's probably more likely that people are going to sign up for a study like this if they were out and happy and whatnot. Most of the participants were openly LGBTQ as leaders. Um, but not, they weren't necessarily had always been open as an LGBTQ person in their job. And so we kind of like, they, they would talk about like, well, in my previous institution or my previous job, I was not out, um, but I am now. So really a lot of variability there. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions? Let me uh, add one to Erin as you, uh, First to Erin about your, you know, your presentation. One of the issues that often comes up, and we've been hearing this even at Hofstra and, and many, many other institutions, this idea of diversity and the pipeline issue and saying that's not the only factor because that's often brought up when you're recruiting and you know, as a reason why we cannot get candidates. But you brought up something to me, which was kind of uh, something that we query about this idea of mentoring, right? And how we locate mentoring, uh, mentors, but also the, the burden that some people see of mentoring. I mean, I see this in many organizations where uh, when we have the people of color kind of session, you know, where people say we're being asked to do a lot. And, you know, some of it in the, in the academic climate is it does it focus, make us focus too much on service when we also have to write our papers or whatever. And I'm, I'm wondering in your data, as you collected, you know, these mentors and you have this idea, which we, I think is excellent and some associations have done it, which is to go to professional organizations too, right? And see their caucuses. Did you find uh, people speaking about challenges of mentoring? Um, so that's another, it's a great question and one that we definitely have been thinking about. I think we have yet to analyze, we do ask the mentors related to that. And that is also, we do, we're collecting open-ended data on um, how they found this frequency to be um, and, and the burden associated with this. Um, one of the huge, again, assets of having the grant funding was that we also were able to compensate our participants for their feedback, which, although, um, you know, more nominal than we would want, um, I think, though, at least makes that um, clear that, that, again, like, this is something that they're doing um, out of their time. Um, but we haven't analyzed that data yet. I imagine we will find that. Um, and I should mention this too, just to highlight the, um, while not a part of this project, kind of a dual effort from the diversity committee that we're working on is we're outsourcing mentorship here, but we also want to make sure that our current faculty improve and gain um, mentorship and mentoring, right? And so that's that we're currently gathering resources and we have an upcoming training for um, our faculty that we were hoping that again, that can kind of be a dual effort, um, right? So then that way we no longer, we can kind of develop within Hofstra uh, better mentorship. Thank you. Alfreda, do you have, Alfreda has a question, right? Yes. I got that. Yeah. I enjoy both presentations, Nick and Aaron. But I, when I was listening to your presentation earlier, Aaron, I just had a question. I may have missed what you were, um, how you were explaining it. But when you were talking about the quantitative measures, you were talking about uh, the. You listed a number of measures that you were looking at: uh, satisfaction with program, psychological distress, uh, and uh, uh, scales. Is that something you're administering to both the mentor and the mentee? And 
and there were others. So what is your goal? I guess I want to know what it is that you're thinking that you can get from those kind of individual subscales. Yes, great question. And I, I apologize if that was not clear. We are giving um, both men mentors and mentees the same survey to collect from both. Um, our main purpose, however, in doing that was more focused on the mentees. So we were interested in whether um, our, our guess was that um, perhaps uh, experiences of perceived discrimination may not change. However, um, the availability of a mentor and that mentorship relationship may influence the um, distress and um, peace. And so looking at over time, um, does having access to um, this mentorship experience decrease um, distress over time? Um, looking at, again, alongside these perceived discrimination um, this perceived discrimination measurement. So we will have it from both, but our main intention was to look for um, the mentees first. Maybe, you know, looking at what the mentor, had, the whole dis distress scale for the mentor would be interesting too, just to find out, going back to what Maggie was talking about, about the stress and challenge of being a mentor, you know, and then looking at how the stress impacts them would be interesting as well. Thank that, you. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. We definitely can, can and, and should do that. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one for Nick. Uh, Nick, you know, when you were doing this, it was, uh, a, 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 you know, it's an incredibly interesting study. Uh, you mentioned about leadership and I'm wonder, wondering whether you, in your study or in the interviews, they gave a sense of time, you know, the time factor. I, I think of people who I've known uh, from the LGBT community who have been leadership positions, how within the industry they are at a different point as the industry changes or the environment changes, there's more of a, uh, a comfort zone. You see, I'm using my hands too. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a part of what I'm trying to say here is, I think it'd be interesting to see in a study because there are some things that are, co you know, in sociology we say which are covert and overt or symbolic or latent and manifest, right? And does that, as you said, verbal and nonverbal, how does this play out over a period of time? Does the leadership feel, does that change over in the past 10 years, for example? Uh, have, did they speak about that, the people you, you know, you interviewed, that the understandings of leadership and comfort zones become different and acceptance too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, like, you know, a number of our participants were, you know, in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And so they had been like, identifying as LGBTQ for decades, but not necessarily being open about it, you know, and so some of the participants did talk about, you know, well, now I can, well, some are retired now, but some were saying like, yeah, now I'm out. And it's, it's not, you know, it's something that people talk about. It's not a big deal. But like, when I first became a leader 30 years ago, of course, we didn't talk about it. And then it got to the point that like we could talk to some people about it, but some people not. And just all of the experiences that you'd expect of like, you know, I was a leader and, you know, in the eighties and nineties. And so of course we had to like go to like the old boys club, you know, we went golfing and we went to this and we went to that. And I had to like straighten up and act, you know, differently and how different it is now. I think also what was interesting about this is because we also, on the other hand, had a lot of people that were in their early 20s um, starting out their career and just kind of the experience of like what, how they're identifying hardship and how they're identifying challenge and how that differs from how someone who's like 70 years old talking about what challenges they experienced and whatnot. And just kind of from the perspective of like how much LGBTQ equality has changed over the past 50 years. The study that I did here can really show that because it, people uh, from different generations were included. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I just think it's really powerful, Nick, that whole notion of thinking about you know, um, leadership over, over decades even for this community. And I think that it's really important to kind of um, understand how this has changed, how their experiences have changed over time. But what you're saying about what a, a young person now might say who's coming out right now is a lot different from a person who's in their later years um, might say about their experiences. So uh, you have fodder for a lot of uh, research in your documents. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. 
Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. I'm interested in history. I just published a chapter last year on the history of LGBTQ workplace research and um, my field, industrial organization psychology, I'm going to argue is pretty LGBTQ friendly right now. And especially like people that are just coming out of grad school, they see it as like a very um, comfortable field to be in. Cool, absolutely. But it's interesting that like what people that they're just entering the field now don't realize is that like my field was also decades behind every other field of psychology when studying LGBTQ issues. Clinical psychology was writing about LGBT work issues well before people in my field. And we are workplace psychologists. Um, I also write for a blog, uh, a leadership blog, where we talk about like leadership research for a lay audience. And I last month wrote about a Women's History Month. And I looked and uh, it wasn't, the Fortune 500, which I mentioned earlier, has been, uh, has been a list that's been around since 1955. Um, but there was not a female CEO on the Fortune 500 list until 1972. And so like not that many decades ago, there were no female leaders in a Fortune 500 company, which is not necessarily the most representative, but like it's important to kind of understand things as they change over history because people have a short uh, memory and they don't realize like where we are now, you know, it's not that different. It wasn't that long ago when things were completely different. And I think it's really important to highlight. Well, thank you very much. I just want to say before we uh, leave we'll, uh, and give another round of applause, before we do that, I do, I do want to mention that Provost Bolina was here for all your talks and had to just leave for another meeting. Uh, and uh, to share with you what he said, he said, uh, he is so, uh, I'm so very impressed by both these presentations and how we need to have them shared in different venues. So, uh, and that he was sorry, sorry he could wait for the question and answer session to go to another one. So I said I would convey it to, to you all. So thank you very much uh, uh, and a big round of applause. And I hope we will uh, hear you share your presentations in many more venues at Hofstra and outside. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you to all the, the attendees.